Welcome to Autism Weekly, the podcast that discusses autism news, current events, and inclusion. Each week, we welcome a guest to the program to share their unique perspective and expertise as it relates to the fascinating world of autism. I'm your host, Jeff Skabitsky. I'm the founder and president at ABS Kids. I've been in the field of autism and applied behavior analysis as a clinician and advocate for nearly two decades. This week, we welcome BCBA Amanda Taylor to the podcast to share some tips on how to help kiddos on the spectrum make friends. Such an important topic. Amanda is an assistant director at our Cottonwood Heights ABA Therapy Center, where she helps create opportunities for children on the spectrum to learn, socialize, and ultimately meet their goals. Social skills are just one of many important areas of development that she helps children work on. And we're very excited to learn more. Amanda, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me on here. I'm excited to be here. And we're excited to hear from you. I actually was in a conversation just today with a pediatrician in Tennessee, and their number one question was, how are you incorporating peers? How are you incorporating friends into autism treatment? And how does that work in the center? So I'd I'd love just to know, first of all, what is it like working in an ABA therapy center? Working in an ABA therapy center, it is first and foremost just so, so much fun. The environment is, you know, we have so many different children on the spectrum at varying degrees that come here and so many different personalities, so many different strengths that they that each kid brings into the center and it's it just creates a really fun environment that that question is asked a lot how can we help these kids on the spectrum learn these different social skills how can we help them make friends and i think something that us as board certified behavior analysts we are really good at is working with those those little kiddos who that's that's what a lot of us specialize in is helping kids become verbal or help, you know, helping them with those pre-academic skills. But one thing that often gets overlooked is the social skills, that, that social aspect. How can we help them make friends? And that is such an important skill to learn to increase that child's quality of life. So while at the center, we do have a heavy focus on teaching those pre-academic skills, such as attending waiting, turn-taking, which all blend into making friends as well. We also have a heavy focus on increasing those peer interactions, helping them learn to socialize with one another. One thing that's really important that is to realize that just because someone's in the same group or at, they're at the center together, that doesn't mean that they're going to be friends. And that's not what we expect when they come to the center is that we're going to force these friendships upon these kids just because they come to the center. What we hope to do here at the center is teach them the necessary social skills, teach them those skills and set them up for success so they can go out into their natural environment and make friends. I think that all of those skills are so crucial. I think that the idea of being able to utilize friendships to be a teaching vehicle to be able to demonstrate all these learned skills, all these things that I'm trying to incorporate into my life, they're so much more valuable when they're done with your peer set, when they're done with your friends versus just always being adult driven. But that actually gets me to ask that question. So you have different, every child with autism is so different. Every relationship, even if you don't have autism is so different. So give me some examples of, you know, what is a good friend? What is a friend? What is a friendship for somebody with autism at different levels? Maybe that child who doesn't have all the skills. What is their friend? Who's their support? Absolutely. That's a great question. So um, there are the different levels of friendship as well as what looks what's going to look different for each kid depending on where they are and that's something that's so important is for us to meet them where they are maybe they aren't ready to they're not at a point where they are going to be able to have a conversation with someone and share interests and likes they might be at a point where they're just sitting next to a peer tolerating a peer 
engaging in parallel play. And for them, that is where they're at socially and that is appropriate. And to many that wouldn't necessarily be classified as a friendship, but for that kid, that's where we're meeting them. And that's where they're at in for developing, eventually developing into creating more friendships. Do you ever find the idea of, you know, you have two kids that are just doing parallel play or that are just kind of sitting next to each other. Do you find that they gravitate to that child more and more frequently? Is that the connection you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. Where just to anyone observing, they might just see two kids playing next to each other, not engaging in any, any conversation. They're not engaging in even the same toys. They're just next to each other playing with each other. But what we find when they come to the center is oftentimes those kids will come and sit in that same spot with the same toys, but gravitate and go to that peer over and over day after day. And eventually they might start to begin to play with one another or engage in the same toys, but they do tend, even though, even from that very, that simplest form of play, that parallel play, they tend to gravitate towards certain peers and sit with one another and play next to one another. So many times a kid starts at the center and a parent will say to us, I just want them to have friends. And that's heartbreaking to hear often, you know, to hear parents say that that's their biggest goal for their child is for them to have a friend because everyone should have that. And that shouldn't be something that parents should have to worry that their child won't have friends. And when a child starts at our center and they don't have any of those necessary social skills to make friends and they just start with that parallel play within a few months we usually see that they do tend to like I said gravitate towards those peers as well as they start you know if one of the the peers that they're in the same group with or that they tend to gravitate towards is gone they are lost they seem lost they wander around they're not exactly sure where to go because that peer that they haven't even ever had a conversation with Uh, they're not there and it's throwing them out of their routine. And that's a person that's a source of comfort for them. Amanda, can you paint the picture before we pivot to those complex relationships, which, you know, I, I think that everybody is still navigating through no matter what your walk of life, but for these younger children and as a parent, if you're looking at, you know, what are the things that I'm hoping that I'm seeing from my child? Or what are the important things to understand that, you know, this is a peer my child seeking out? Is it, is it the body language? Is it that they're paying more attention to what that one child is doing? What, what is it that you're looking for as a therapist to know, hey, this, this is a good relationship. This is a good skill building opportunity with a friend. What are you looking for? Absolutely. One thing that we are always here at the center that we are always encouraging is that natural environment teaching that naturalistic play. So we're going to look through the child directed. So if if a child is showing interest in a certain peer, we're going to lean into that and we're going to encourage encourage that even if it's something as they're just interested in sitting next to them. They're interested in, you know, being in the same room as them, then we're going to take that opportunity and encourage that, build on that more. Because I think the biggest, most important thing to do when you're teaching a child social skills is just to give them that exposure, just to give them more oppor- as many opportunities as you can. We don't want to force friendships. We don't want to put them, make them uncomfortable, but we do want to give them the opportunity to be exposed and have the opportunity, the more opportunities they have, the more comfortable they'll become and the more likelihood that they will have the opportunity to make friends. So that's the first thing you want to do when you are starting to teach these social skills is just give the child that opportunity, whether wherever they are on their readiness to make a friend, just give them, expose them to the opportunity, expose them to peers, expose them to different social environments and opportunities so they can become more comfortable. And I, that's a big area that we start with is just that exposure. That sounds like a, a fine line to, to travel is that you hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, what's wrong with this child wanting to just spend time on their own or what's the what's the harm of not socializing and just being content with whatever objects are in my environment to to kind of play with and i know that 
one of the biggest concerns that I would have is that you do see a lot of comorbid diagnoses. You see anxiety and depression um, in late teens because of the lack of opportunity to build that community around you. Um, are there are there other concerns that you'd have of not learning these pivotal social skills to choose your own friendships as life goes on? So that reminds me of a parent, a family I worked with, that I was encouraging the family. They were um, doing in-home set services. And this kid, honestly, the only areas of concern were his social skills. And he was an only child. We weren't able to work on, have those those naturally occurring opportunities with with him during therapy in his home environment to work on those social skills. So I was really encouraging the family to try center-based therapy, to try that so that he would have these so, these natural social opportunities. Because currently his only social opportunities were with his therapist. He was homeschooled as well. So he did great with adults. And that's what his mom always said is he's so good with adults. And I'm not concerned with social skills because in 20 years when he's older, you know, he is an adult. He does so well with adults now he'll be great with those adults. And I, I kind of had to chuckle because I was like, yes, he does so well with adults. And that's very common for a lot of our, our population is they prefer spending time with adults because adults are predictable. They are comforting. They, you know, they will go along. They will let the child dictate play. Um, but when he does become, if he doesn't learn, if he didn't have the opportunities when he was younger, yes, at right now, adults do find him charming and, he's funny and they enjoy spending time with him, but not learning those necessary social skills, the kids that are now that he should have been learning those skills with that are now adults with him will have different. It's almost like what you're, what you're describing is that a lot of these children maybe don't develop flexibility and, and could be more rigid because they're used to people tailoring their response to them and become less aware of their environment and more just expecting that everything is centered around their needs, their relationships versus having a more of a communal thought process. Exactly. Thank you. That is exactly what I was meaning. So you've mentioned that in the centers is that a lot of times is that you're trying to match people by interest or by things that they're gravitating to, which is that natural piece to things, I think. Um, it. How do you do that? I mean, I've heard people talk about, hey, we're going to have uh, sports or we're going to do creative play. I mean, what happens in the center? How do you get these common interests together? That is a great question. So um, I am careful with saying you know, when you when you define what a friend is, especially to a child with autism, what is a friend? You know, when you think of what a friend is, a lot of times you think of common interests. They make you, they're supportive. They make you, they're someone you want to talk to, that you want to be around. But I'm also very careful with bl- making it black and white for these these children on the spectrum. Because I, I worked with a kid who, he was very black and white. You tell him one thing. You're, there's no gray area for him. And we were working on making friendships. He came into the center and we'd worked so hard with him. He was developing these social skills, not necessarily making friends in the center, but going to his school environment and then coming and telling us all about this kid that he goes to school with and going on and on and on. And his parents were going to set up a play date with them. And, you know, by all definition, this sounded like a friend. And we, so I said to him, I was like, this is so great. It sounds like, you know, you have a friend now, you know, this is your friend. And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. He's not my friend. He doesn't like video games, so he can't be my friend. And we had, when we first started teaching him these, these skills, we had said, you know, friends often have common interests. So his one of his main common interests was video games. But because this kid didn't like video games, he said he thought he does not have a common interest with me. Therefore, he can't be my friend. So I'm very careful with sharing that with defining what what a friend looks like and that, you know, pivoting into common interests or this making it black and white. I think that's something it's very, you know, what a friend is to one person is going to be completely different to another person. So I leave that up 
more subjective for that patient. But um, more times, more often than not, you are going to have common interests with your friends and you're not going to have all the same common interests though. And that's where I think that that kiddo definitely didn't quite understand is this kid didn't like everything exactly the same as he did. So he couldn't be his friend, but we were able to explain to him, no, you know, he doesn't like video games, but he likes hearing you talk about video games and you guys both share interest in this. And he came around to finally accepting that he realized, yes, this is a friend. <laughs> I could see that. Uh, so Amanda, I could see that going the opposite direction as well is that, you know, some of, some of the children that, that maybe we work with, wanting to establish a friendship with somebody else and maybe that it's not reciprocated or how, how do you teach the resiliency of trying of continuing to seek out those friendships because that's something as a parent i'd worry about is you know my my child's trying but they're failing or it's just not working out they're not building those so what's that role of kind of making sure that there's some positive reinforcement that that some friends are being are, are being attached during this process. Yes, that is, I think that's every parent's fear is that your child is going to continually try and fail and fail and fail. And I think it's important for kids to have, to, you know, they you don't want them to always be accessing that positive reinforcement. They do need to have times where they do fail because then they have to learn the skill of problem solving and understanding what it makes it makes that positive reinforcement that much more reinforcing when they do contact that. And that's something that we do focus, we want to focus on when we are teaching them these social skills is resiliency is not everyone just because you, you have identified someone that you find fun and have same interests in, they may not have that same interest as you in being your friend. And especially with our older kids, it's an, that that transparency, having those open conversations with them that that friendship might not always be reciprocated, but that's okay. That happens. That's, that's going to happen. And, and not telling them just because you said this, that's going to automatically make them your friend. We're not going to set them up for failure for that. We're going to be open and transparent and say, you may do all of these things, which we are working on to be to be a good friend, and it still might not be reciprocated. And that's okay. That's just everyone has just like you have your autonomy to to make to choose who you want to be friends with. So does everyone else. And making that clear for them that even if you do try, it might may not they may not be successful, but that doesn't mean you should give up. Let's try again. The more opportunities that you try, just like um, I was saying earlier, the more opportunity you have to expose the kids to social opportunities, the more opportunities that they're going and trying and practicing these skills, the higher their likelihood is going to be of making a friendship and contacting that reinforcement. Yeah, that sounds so important. It sounds like a lifelong skill that regardless if you identify autistic or or not, that is one that needs to be built is the idea that I will fail at times. And when yeah. I fail, it's it's a good learning opportunity to figure out, hey, is there something I could do differently? Um, when you were when you were talking through this, I'm just thinking through, OK, so there are times where the resiliency is so important. But as a parent also, is that I want that positive reinforcement that I see my child being successful in building friendships. Have you talked to any families that, you know, they've seen these social skills in place and that friendship that their child finally developed, I, I couldn't imagine the joy on their face. Can you kind of draw this out and and give me that experience that you might have had talking with a family who went through this? Yes. So there was this kid who, when he first started with us in the center, he very much a not even a parallel play kid. He wanted to just be completely on his own, no one around him, nonverbal pretty aggressive and he from from our observations it appeared that he had no interest in others in interacting with kids his age and there was one time when it was during drop off two kids walked out with each other and the parents were talking and their behavior therapists were both like oh they've been these other two kids have formed this great friendship they're friends you know it's so fun to watch them and the mother of this child who the one that came to us that didn't seem to have any interest in peers in kids his age looked to me and said, does my kid have any friends here? 
And it just crushed me. I felt so bad because the the truth of the matter is at that time, he did not. He 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 just wasn't interested in interacting. And he may have been interested. He just didn't have the skill set to interact with kids his age. And hearing the mother say that, that, you know, that that showed me this isn't this is so important to this mother that her child gets these friendships. Now we need to work on a lot. You know, we need to decrease some behaviors and increase other behaviors to get him get him there. But this is very socially valid for this mother. She this is something that's very important for her. And I'd, I'd argue that most parents are going are that socially valid for them. That's very important for their kid to have that friend. So we really started focusing on that more once we were able to get some of his behaviors down and we were able to start increasing some more of his functional skills, really target and narrow in into those social skills. And the day that he walked out of the center with another kid, they were kind of just laughing and had been playing tag with one another and walked outside and you know, the, the therapist had to be like, Hey, your parents are here. The joy on that mother's face was priceless. She was ecstatic. She was just so, so happy. And in that moment, her and that other parent, they exchanged contact information and had planned to set up a play date. And that, that was just, that was a really exciting moment for us to see that yeah. friendship form, to see yeah. where he came from, to see that. And just to see the look on that mother's face that her son did have a, a friend. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I mean, that's those are the things that we do our work for. It's to be able to establish meaningful relationships. It's to give the children and the families that chance to to feel success in building out a community around them. And so on that note, I mean, what's your recommendation to families when, when they're struggling through this? I mean, what is your advice to be able to help encourage them through the process? I strongly recommend, one, not giving up. First and foremost, not giving up. Even if your child does not seem to be interested in kids his age, continue to give them those opportunities. That is so important to give them those opportunities and to not give up. Every person, whether they show it or not, craves human interaction. That is human nature. That is, you know, you think of your personal relationships. I think of my personal relationships. And that's what motivates me to do what I do each day. You know, that's, that's, that is where my personal relationships are my biggest positive reinforcers in my life. And we want to give that opportunity to the kids that we work with to increase their quality of life. And even though they may not show, and that's something else that I always tell parents, even though they may not show that they are interested, they just, right now, they just don't have the skill set to show that, to show that they are interested or to to develop those, those friendships or those relationships. But don't give up. Continue to try. Continue to give them opportunities. And it, it might be a slow process, but progress will be made. And can I share, there's one more piece of advice that I'd love to give clinicians is when you are teaching, this is something I see so, so often that I, and I was guilty of this when I first started working in this field, is a lot of times people will teach kids on the spectrum social skills and they will teach them rote skills. This is what you say when someone says this. And that is something where I would really discourage people to teach rote skills, give them a variety of examples, make it naturalistic, and don't teach them skills that aren't natural for their other peer, their other peers. I see so many times where they will have people will put in their treatment plan to have a five-year-old go up to a kid, group of kids who's playing tag and ask them if they can join and play. That's not naturalistic. Just the kid just joins and play. Any other five-year-old is just going to join and play. So don't teach them rote skills. Make sure you're teaching it where it's natural to the environment of, of what's socially acceptable to the to what their other their their neurotypical peers are doing as well. And give them make it child directed and give them lots of opportunities to generalize those skills. And I'll end with one little story that I had where I was teaching social skills to this group of class when I did my student teaching in a transition school. So that's for children 18 to 21 years old. And it was actually this one was the kid was going, we were practicing what to do when you go on a date. And the, I was this kid, this guy took me out on a date. We're at the door. He's dropping me off. 
and we were practicing what what you say, how you end a date. And I threw a curveball and I was like, oh no, I forgot my my keys into my house. Now I'm locked out just to kind of see how he would respond and see if he would be able to navigate instead of just giving the re rote responses that he had been given for to end a date. And he acts like he pulls out of his pocket a set of keys and says, oh, I've got a copy for you and hands it to me. So <laughs> I would say don't teach kids rote skills, make them practice role play and give them opportunities to practice these unexpected responses to make it more, give them opportunities to practice in the natural environment. I think that's great advice. And I, and I also think that as the children get older and as these relationships become more complex, I'd, I'd also let families know is that you will have struggles. There will be new things that your child hasn't experienced yet, but similar to them conquering some of those initial challenges is that they're going to work through it. And it just takes that time and that, that support and that positive reinforcement that you already mentioned to be able to help them navigate some of these challenges that we, we all will experience in life. But uh, I appreciate you coming on the show today, Amanda. And uh, quite frankly, I think that you'll be presenting at the Critical Issues Conference in Salt Lake City on similar issues, social skill development. And I think that that's so valuable for the clinical community, the school community, the family community, just to be able to kind of hear some of these techniques that you've embedded into the center experience for the children. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post new podcasts. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week. Thank <music> you.